so meanwhile, the rest of the world is calm, quiet, and peaceful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we had an election in Iran yeah. where a moderate won, and we had more bloodshed in Syria, and it looks like Assad is winning. So where does that leave Obama? Well, it, those two things are related, as it turns out, because the two things that happened this week were the U.S. kind of welcomed the election of President Rouhani, the new Iranian president, because he's you know, relatively more moderate and has been relatively more flexible on nuclear issues than just about everybody else, which isn't saying much, but it's saying something. At the same time, President Obama says, okay, I'm in, we're going to start arming the rebels in Syria. Well, if you, if you arm the rebels in Syria and they defeat President Assad in Syria, that's a big blow to the Iranians. And so there are big stakes on both the nuclear issue and on the Syrian issue for the Iranians just as this new president comes into power. But do we really think that the new Iranian president has enough maneuvering room? I mean, they, the, yeah. the Ayatollah still runs the show. He yeah. let some of the other people, wouldn't let them run. Yeah, most people don't think so. Um, although, you know, there's also a theory that um, there's a deal out there that even the, you know, the, the religious leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, wants to do in the long run that lets the Iranians go right up to the edge of actually producing nuclear weapons, but stop just short of there. Because they get the best of both worlds in that sense. They have nuclear capability. Everybody knows it. They have demonstrated they could move across the line if they wanted to, but they don't have to bear all the carry all the baggage that goes with actually having nuclear weapons in defiance of the international community. This is, in a way, what the Israelis worry about the most. I mean, they're obviously worried about the Iranian bomb, but they're also worried about an Iranian regime that has uh, well-known nuclear capabilities but isn't under sort of international sanctions and is free to bully its neighbors without having to pay the price for it. Hmm. And when you look at what the president did, he was at a G8 meeting, he tried to bring along some of the other countries on Syria. Did he make much progress apart from Russia, which Nobody really well, expected much. Here's but. the way it worked. In the G8, everybody was trying to bring Obama along on Syria to start arming. They succeeded in that. Now, the last guy left on the other side is, is Putin from right. Russia, and they made no right. progress on that. The Russians are not going to let go of Assad. I think that's right. the one thing they made clear this week. Um, support of Syria and support of President Assad, uh, that's the last place the Russians have in the Middle East where they have any real influence. They're going to be very reluctant to let that go. That's why I think if you're going to get rid of President Assad in Syria, and start to stabilize the place. The only way to do that is to convince the Russians they will have a role in a post-Assad Syria. And they're cynical enough, they don't Why don't we just that. give them the whole mess? Well, you know, there would be something to be said for that, because whoever takes over fixing Syria after this is done, but that's Assad a, seems that's to be a winning. That's a ten-year proposition. But Assad seems to be winning. At the moment, right? Well, he started to, and I think the, uh, the, that was what tipped the U.S. Into, into acting. I mean, he seemed to have weathered the worst of it over the last two years. Uh, he got help from Hezbollah, the Hezbollah militia next door in Lebanon. They sent thousands of fighters in. That tipped the balance. That tipped the balance toward um, uh, the government and away from the rebels. And that got everybody nervous and got the White House nervous. And that's probably the reason President Obama acted.